everyone that stuck around. I'm Phil Carlson, uh, Managing Director at KCSA. We are a strategic communications firm based in Midtown Manhattan. Take me out. And I head up our cannabis investor relations practice. So we have a great panel here tonight. So thank you, everyone who stayed. And thank you, Benzinga, for letting us do this. Um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, uh, starting with William. And uh, I had nine questions, down to six after the last panel. Um, so we can get everybody out here and can start drinking. We're not mic'd up. Thank you all for being here. I know it's late. Uh, my name is William Simpson. I'm the CEO of Golden Leaf Holdings. We're a publicly traded, vertically integrated company in Canada, Oregon, Nevada, and California. We have all parts of the value chain from cultivation, extraction, manufacturing, distribution, and retail. I am Taz Turner, the CEO of Cordova Can. Uh, we are an owner of assets of uh, production and processing assets in on the West Coast. We have assets currently in Colorado and Oregon and soon to be in Nevada and California and uh, sh in short order uh, moving into the international markets as well. Thank you. Uh, Julius Kalsvich, the CFO of Ianthus Capital Holdings. Uh, we went public about two years ago, one of the first guys in the U.S. licensed cannabis market to have gone public. Uh, we're currently in six different states, Florida, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Mexico, and Colorado. Hi, I'm Andrew Toot. I'm the CFO of Forefront Ventures. Uh, we are also a multi-state operator. We're more focused on uh, limited license states. Uh, we currently have licenses in Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, so 2018 has been a wild year, I guess, in this space. I guess the last three days have been wild in this space. Um, so for the panelists, I guess, you know, what are the best ways that cannabis operators are, how are they going to differentiate themselves as the market continues to mature? So Andrew, why don't we start with you? You have the mic. Um, I started my career, as I, I, I said earlier at my presentation, I started my career um, as an investment analyst. Um, uh, and, and small ca looking at small cap companies primarily. And whenever a big market you know, presents itself, the internet, telecom, whatever it is, there's always you know, this initial rush and there are a bunch of players that come in and there's a lot of excitement. I mean, there are, it's, a, it's a huge new industry. And you know, there's this initial rush and then eventually you know, there's a shakeout that inevitably happens. And so you know, everyone's really running hard trying to cover a lot of ground, but I think ultimately it's gonna come down to execution. Um, there's going to come a day where, probably in the next year or two, um, where you know hitting quarters matters and producing EBITDA matters and, and running great operations matter. Um, and I, I think that that, where the rubber's really going to hit the road, is who's doing a good job executing on their business model and who's not. Thanks. Um, following up sort of on that point, it's execution. And the other key thing I think is not just execution, but scalability. How are you executing that you're going to be able to be scalable? Uh, even though we're a U.S.-based company, I sit up in Toronto and I've watched sort of what's happened with the Canadian industry over the past four years. The initial guys who were public four years ago in Canada, the large ones who got out of the gate first and were able to scale are the ones with the largest valuation and they've continued to have the largest valuation. And I find when we're focused in the US, it's about scale um, out of the gate, who can get that scale, who can move quickly with it, um, who can put the right systems, the right people in place in order to not just be in six states like us, but in 10 and 12 and 15. Um, that's gonna be the key thing, uh, I think for any operator, how you get that skill. Yeah, I, I fully agree with, with both the prior panelists. I think at the end of the day, cash flow is gonna matter at some point and people are gonna wanna have sustainable businesses that, uh, and, and use that cash flow to get into other markets and, and build scale. Um, in addition to that, I think that, you know, what I would as a, is I think from a competitive standpoint, I think technology is gonna matter at some point in this business. And I think that technology is what's gonna drive people to products that are delivered, that are delivered uh, high quality and that have a consistent consumer experience. And I think that's gonna um, drive a lot more people as this becomes uh, recreational legal in Canada, certainly in places across the world and, uh, and eventually perhaps in the United States. I think that's gonna drive the person sitting on the sideline that's not using cannabis uh, to the market and that's what's gonna uh, make this a bigger TAM than it is today. I would agree with these gentlemen that execution is extremely important, but what it 
I do believe it will come down to ultimately is brand and consumer brand awareness. In any other industry, whether it's alcohol, food, beverage, the brands are what ultimately win. And you have to have a consistency in your brand. The consumer has to trust your brand. I mean, they have to understand what's going into the product, has to be full transparency and education around that product, the delivery mechanism, how it's created, and it has to be a consistent brand message to the market all the time. Uh, we have a portfolio of brands. We put these out. We see a lot of consumers every single day, and we see the things that they do care about. They want to know what they're buying is the same thing every single time consistently. They want to know what ingredients are in it, just like anything. I mean, you don't want to buy Advil that was blended in a bathtub, right? They know when you go to the consumer and you buy that brand. It's not Advil, it's ibuprofen. They have become the product. And I believe the brands out there, you know, I, we say it at Chalice Farms, it's, you know, instead of Advil, you'll think Chalice. Instead of Lorazepam, you'll think Chalice. Instead of Valium, you'll think Chalice. As an alternative, and we hope that at some point the medical community will start talking about it that way as well but I do believe it will be the brands. There are a lot of great brands that are evolving in the cannabis space now, and um, I do believe there will be you know, the top 50 that, that basically make it to the top over the next couple of years. It's gonna be kind of a battle to get there. It does have to follow up with execution, of course, or, or be led by execution to, to be effective at getting the brand to market, but I, I do believe that's gonna have a large play into how cannabis shakes out for differentiation purposes. All right, so staying on that in terms of the brands and, you know, you're, you're in this every day. You're seeing what consumers are out there buying. What, what, are they, what are consumers looking at today? What will they be looking at, you know, 12 months from now? Yeah, so the, the current cannabis user, I and mean, we've kind of broken it down into four different individuals. It's, it's the heavy user. It's the old cannabis novice that tried it once back in the 60s. It's the career mom or dad. And then it's the super conservative that won't even look at cannabis, right? Um, the majority of the market today is the heavy cannabis user. They're coming in and looking at shatters and joints and they're dabbing and things that, you know, I, I don't frankly understand a lot about um, just because I don't get the idea of using a torch, but uh, that's just me. I do believe the new cannabis consumer is going to be using the more approachable products, the vape pens, the edibles, the tinctures, the encapsulated nutraceuticals. This is going to be like health and wellness. And we see that, um, you know, in Chalice Farms, we do a lot of education to the consumer. And we see like, in BDS market analytics in, in the stores in Oregon show about half of the market is still flour. In our stores, it's about 35%. And that's because the type of person that we're educating and advertising to is that new cannabis consumer. It's the, the red ocean, blue ocean, blue ocean me methodology or idea. We are creating a market. The consumer of cannabis tomorrow isn't what we're seeing today. It's the person that doesn't even think about cannabis. They'll take nine Advil, but they don't think as a CBD tincture is even an option for them. That's going to change. And it is changing on a daily basis. We see it. We take that one consumer that didn't understand the benefits and potentials as an alternative, and we turn them into an evangelist. And that person goes and tells five of their friends, I thought all those same things about the stigma of, of you know, Tommy Chong and bongs, and it's not that at all. You got to come in and experience it for yourself and see what the future is going to be. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think right now the consumer's coming at quality or price. It's one or the other. I think um, what William is saying is, is totally true in, in terms of the types of different products that people are looking for. But what I'd add to that is I think they're also eventually going to be looking for this new cannabis user, the, qual the products that aren't being made yet, that aren't being marketed yet, the beers, the wines, the waters, the drops, and things of that nature that, that are more approachable, easier to use, um, still have that uh, consistent consumer experience. And, um, you know, like I said, grows this market from where it is today. Thanks. Yeah, um, I would say right now is sort of the consumer that we're seeing or the patient that we're seeing, what they're the most focused on is convenience. And I want to talk about, for instance, one of the markets that we're in. We haven't necessarily opened in the New York state market, but I think that's all about convenience. Because if you look at what's happened in New York over the past couple of years, it has been an incredibly slow program to take hold with any patients. And why is that? Because there was no convenience. It was incredibly difficult to get a medical card. It was hard to find a doctor. It was hard to find a dispensary. The products were incredibly expensive. And when you have New York City, which is the largest black market in the world, and it is so difficult to operate in a medical market, if that convenience is not there, people are gonna continue to go to a path that they already know, which is a sort of black market. And I think out of the gate right now, it has to be, if you're going to have, uh, doesn't matter that there's a program there, it has to be a convenient program for the patients who are there or whether it's the consumers that are there, that's how it has to all be teed up. 
I, th I think this panel's set up interestingly because you have a West Coast lens that sort of comes down to an East Coast lens. And the West Coast is, you know, they're very, they're, they're, they're much further along than we are on the East Coast in terms of the number of dispensaries out there and, and how ingrained cannabis is in the culture out there. And so I totally agree with William that, yes, this is going to be, you know, we're going to get away from flour and this is really going to be a product company. On the East Coast, you have a market where people are saying, holy crap, I don't just go to a guy and get a bag. I can go into the store and get 18 strains and this is, you know, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. And so I think that right now, you know, convenience and, 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 and quality to some point, but it's really customer.